the screening system today is a disaster. In addition to that, we're spending vastly more money. We're basically on our own. All of this illusion of airport security doesn't make us any safer. Terrorists have no respect for our war on terrorism because they know we're not serious. With that security business they do, always, always will find the holes in it. We don't know really what happened on 9-11. Our ghosts haunt us. We're no better off now than we were then. On the evening of September 10th, 2001, at Dulles International Airport, the rush was over. Argon Bright security employee Eric Gill had just returned to supervising the West Checkpoint. He saw something strange. Gill, a Pakistani man who fled to the U.S. to escape religious persecution, did not want his face shown. I saw about five uh, Middle Eastern people there. We're walking to the side door we have at uh, West Checkpoint, which is uh, accessed by only few uh, restricted people. I noticed that three of them were wearing a uniform and IDs. Two other guys who were not wearing a uniform right. and had no IDs, and they were trying to escort these two guys through there. As soon as they walked inside the checkpoint, they just stopped there and started watching around. That made me suspicious. Gil's suspicions were well placed. The men, dressed in United Airlines ground workers' uniforms, wanted access to a door that led to the concourse and parked planes. The men tried to use one electronic badge to swipe through. Gill stopped them. They didn't like it, and he abused me, and he said, F off. We are people you don't know. You should be allowed to go through here, but you make your own rules. And he just walked out with it. Eric Gill and other witnesses took no further action, but the Middle Eastern men were not through. Gill would later identify two of the men as the Al-Qaeda hijackers of a plane from Boston, as well as American Airlines Flight 77 out of Dulles. The Flight 77 hijackers prepared for their destiny at the Marriott Residence Inn, a quick drive from Dulles. Coincidentally, that same night, the Saudi royal family's leading funder for Islamic causes was occupying a room in that very hotel. Of all places to stay, this guy picked the same hotel as the hijackers. One possibility is that the hijackers may have all gathered together to get one last good luck from this fellow. We don't know because when the FBI tried to talk to him, he faked a heart attack. Though we don't know what happened the night before, on September 11th, the Dulles hijackers carried out their mission by crashing American Airlines Flight 77 into the Pentagon. It was like a, a cruise missile with wings. Explosion, a great ball of fire, and smoke started billowing out. Within two hours, the FBI, immigration, and all other authorities locked down the airport. Security screeners were taken to the baggage area to be interviewed. Argenbright supervisor Ed Nelson watched employee after employee disappear. We would get phone calls and saying, hey, send this person down. Now send this person down. And what started occurring was they weren't coming back. They weren't coming back from the, the customs area where they were doing the interviews. Hours and hours went by. And I would call and nobody would call. And I, I would finally get a call back saying, don't expect this one to come back. Don't expect this guy to come back. He's gone. And they would just take him from the airport down to D.C. and lock him up. In the process, the authorities threw out some key witnesses. Probably the most incredibly poor decision made by the authorities was that the key uh, security guard at Dulles Airport, who was the last man between the airport, airplanes and, and the hijackers, was never questioned about what he saw on the night of September 10th. Eyewitnesses were the only remaining source. 58 of the hard drives for the electric badges were confiscated by the FBI, along with the security camera video. Did you ever sneak a look at that videotape to see if it was the same people? No, it never happened with me. I don't know why. <laughs> Ed Nelson saw the tape just hours after the attack. Because right when they showed me the tape, 
Yeah, they rolled it, stop. Now there's one. Roll it, stop. There's the second one. I mean, they knew right away, and there was many of people coming through that checkpoint at the but, same time. But it, how would they know? The FBI claimed they had no idea who these hijackers were. Oh, exactly. Yeah, it, 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 it boggles my mind. What it says to me is they, if they knew them that morning, they knew who they were the day before, and they should have been able to cat, catch them before they got to the airport. It wasn't until a week later when Gill's wife showed him a National Enquirer story with color photographs of the hijackers that he was finally able to make a positive ID. And I said, these two guys, I have seen them. I know these were the two who were there at the airport. It didn't matter. The FBI was done with Gill. We don't know if there were accomplices working at Dulles Airport with the hijackers that were never arrested. And this is one of the biggest holes in the 9-11 case. Instead of using the screeners as witnesses, the Argenbright employees took the blame for 9-11. In a press conference in October 2001, Attorney General John Ashcroft accused Argenbright of an astonishing pattern of crimes that could have directly jeopardized public safety. The authorities, the FBI particularly, had one role. And that role was to go out to Dulles Airport and prove that the private screeners had done a bad job. From the standpoint of the Bush administration, if you don't blame the screeners, you immediately start looking at the U.S. intelligence apparatus. If the screening had nothing to do with 9-11, then we've just wasted all this time and money building this huge agency that is doing us no good. United States began proving just how serious they weren't about terrorism in Lebanon in the mid-1980s. The timeline of FBI history lists a great achievement on September 13, 1987, with the elaborate arrest of hijacker Fawaz Yunus. In June 1985, Yunus had been involved in two hijackings in one week. He served 18 years in prison. And during the 18 years he served in prison, nobody from the FBI, the FAA, or any government agency concerned about hijackings and airline security ever went to see him to ask him one single question. How did you do it? How did you do it? Tell me how it worked. Honestly, uh, if I explain to you and I tell you the story, like, and you don't have the feeling, you look at me and you think I'm crazy. Well, I, well, forgive me, <laughs> taking an aircraft, but eight, eight sky marshals were armed with machines. I, I was crazy. Four guys. Honestly, I was crazy. Yeah. Believe me, it took me three minutes to have full control. Yunus, a Lebanese Shia and member of the Amal militia, received orders to hijack a Royal Jordanian Airlines flight in protest of the Palestinian presence in Lebanon. With eight sky marshals on board, he and his colleagues took the plane without injuring any passengers. It was a miracle to me. I don't kill nobody. It was a miracle to me. Everybody got safe. It was a miracle to me. I returned safe. It was, I never accepted that. After holding the plane for over 24 hours and making stops at several different airports, Eunice unloaded the passengers, read a speech that explained their mission, and blew up the empty plane. He was sent into hiding in West Beirut. We got to let all the world know the truth right. and know our problems. Right. And at the time, we don't have uh, TV stations, internet. We don't have no satellite. No radio, no. We don't have no, I'm say, international radios, for example. We don't have no embassies, embassies or ambassadors all over. All we got our machine guns and our heart. Just days later. Three Lebanese jihadists hijacked TWA Flight 847 in Athens. The hijacking quickly turned violent. After the plane landed in Beirut, one of the 153 passengers, Navy diver Robbie Stedham, was murdered. I was in the area when they killed him. I was, you know, I saw the body drop on the ground. Why did they kill the diver? I believe because they tried to negotiate with the United States. 
for the release of uh, Lebanese prisoners in Israeli jail. And the time United States sent signals they are not going to negotiate with terrorists. So had they been willing to talk, at least send a message to the Israelis, if it's possible the diver's life could have been saved? Yes, definitely, for sure. If United States at the time shown any sign for like going to negotiate or to talk to the people, the, you know, he's still alive. The man who orchestrated the hijacking was on the CIA payroll as the United States' main conduit to Iran. He had planned to rescue the people he'd ordered hijacked. This plan was now in jeopardy. How did you end up on the TWA plane? You know, because I was, uh, at the time, Amal was in full control of Beirut International Airport right. to protect the Beirut International Airport. Actually, we are in full control in Beirut. Amal leader Nabi Berry was the man in charge. He believed Yunus capable of bringing the TWA hijacking to a close without any more casualties. When you have five people with weapons on a plane now from Amal, so now they are in full control. Your guys are in full yes. control? Yes. Now, now are two guys from another side, this, they know that. You know, they don't they have no more. so crazy that, right, okay. That's they right. don't have no control at so all. So basically, now. Barry took control of the plane. Yes, you. yes. So that was it, you took over the hijacking? Yes. Okay, and the purpose was somebody to solve it. The CIA had their own rescue mission ready, but the CIA in Beirut disobeyed the rescue order from President Reagan. Why didn't they carry out the orders? Because Nabi Berry had been on their payroll for years, so Nabi Berry could embarrass the hell out of the U.S. government at this point. So instead, Berry orchestrated a series of negotiations with the hostages over a 17-day period. This problem, it will be finished in 24 hours. He became a very popular man in, in the politics of Lebanon. And international, too. He got a lot of credibility. Two years later, Eunice became a star for the Reagan administration. The one hijacker they managed to get was actually responsible for saving several hundred American lives. The capture of Fawaz Eunice is full of irony. The man who turned him in was CIA informant Jamal Hamdan, a petty criminal in Beirut. Jamal Hamdan goes to his case officer at the CIA and says, I can get you a terrorist. Hamdan had been a driver for Eunice years before, and now the two became partners in cigarette smuggling. After several successful trades, Jamal told Eunice he had arranged a meeting with an important buyer. This man was really an Arabic-speaking FBI agent. I never trust him, but I always in my mind thinking that, that he is not going to make a mistake with me because his family in Lebanon, and he knows that for sure if anything happened to me, his family go and pay the price. What Eunice didn't know was that the CIA had agreed to bring Hamdan's entire family to the U.S. and pay them millions. We resettled the entire family at a cost of between 10 and 20 million dollars. Today, the Hamdans run a series of cigar stores in the Washington area called Cigar World. It doesn't make sense in terms of what, how we behave as a country. It could have just as easily been Eunice and his family set up here in business and the Hamdans in prison. You know, it, it was just whoever was going to cooperate and whoever was going to sell out. We put them in a position where they feel like they got nothing to lose. And that's, a, and that's a scary thing. You have to understand one thing. It doesn't matter if 100% people go through screening. You have to, nobody can know what in a people's hearts. You're going to screen people's hearts and minds.